Hello everyone, it's Mr. Moomaw here, welcoming you to a third edition of U.S. History Part 1, or U.S. History First Section. Numbers are all confusing, sorry. Uh, today we're going to be talking about two distinct events uh, that uh, one's war, one's peace, but they both go together uh, to help form a distinctively American identity. And as we move into uh, the uh, prelude to the Revolution, to the Revolutionary War, uh, this, this here today we're going to talk about this is where you see the first break, the first sense that there's something about us in America that is not British, the first stirrings of a kind of national identity, an identity distinct from uh, identity as Englishmen. And those two events are, first of all, the French and Indian War, which is a smaller part of the wider Seven Years War that's happening essentially all over the world, uh, and the First Great Awakening. Uh, one of a series of religious revivals, something you're going to see over and over again in American history. So, I hope you're all ready. That's what we're talking about today. Now, one thing you'll notice right off the bat, for whatever bizarre reason, there's all kinds of glare today. I don't know. I've literally spent two hours trying to figure out what's wrong with the camera, why it's just uh, so bright, so dang much. I don't know. I tried, but it's glaring. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to send this entire PowerPoint presentation uh, down to your teachers and I'm going to try to put uh, each slide of it as a just still essentially at the end of this video. So after you've watched this, if you didn't see something, you can skip ahead in the video. At the very end, each, each slide that I'm showing you will be a still and you can look at them individually uh, whenever you feel it. Just skip to the end, look at it, pause it as long as you want to look at it and then just you know move on to the others. All right. So, when you're talking about the French and Indian War, talking about the First Great Awakening, you're talking about building an identity as Americans. Uh, this is a great place to start. Uh, the blurry-faced gentleman, unfortunately, sorry, the glare gentleman you see behind me, this is George Washington. Now, George Washington, as you can see, he's wearing a fancy military uniform. I think even the face is all glared for some reason. You can still see his nice uniform. Uh, George Washington was a career military man. Most of his life was spent uh, as a soldier, at least the, the, what he considered the most important part of his life was his identity as a soldier. Uh, Washington comes from one of those Virginia planter families. We're going to see this over and over again. Uh, you know, people like Madison, people like Jefferson, Monroe, just over and over again. These guys who, they come from this background of being plantation owners. Uh, that's their, that's their sort of social identity. That's where they come from. But they, they, a lot of these guys will carve out a life doing something else as well. Now, Washington, he comes from a plantation-owning family, uh, but they are not by any means at the top rung of plantation-owning society ladder. Uh, Washington's you know, his poor rich, I guess you'd call him. Uh, Washington's at the bottom of that social heap. Uh, Washington has an older brother named Lawrence, uh, I mean, set to you know, inherit things and stuff. So Washington really has to go out and basically earn a living. Uh, one thing he does as a young man that's really going to help him out later is uh, he gets trained as a surveyor. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those guys on the highway. The little, uh, it's like a telescope, and, and they'll be looking at another telescope along the way, getting the grade of the land, stuff like that. That's surveying. And what surveying basically is about is mapping out the land. You go to a place, uh, you know, frontier, land's just wild, everything like that. Guys like Washington are really important. They go out there and make cartographic, make map sense of what they see out there. By carefully, uh, by carefully examining and uh, establishing boundaries around each plot of land, the land can then be taken by the government and sold off to people in plots that everyone's going to recognize. Where, where does my property stop and yours start, or vice versa? This is who you turn to to figure those things out. And once he's recorded all his information, divided up the land into plots, makes that a whole lot easier. Now, over and against that, you've got the idea of just moving out in the middle of the woods, building a cabin, claiming everything around you to the tree or the creek, and then having to fight it out with your neighbors for years over who owns what. Surveying, recording land boundaries, all that's a very, very, very important part of settling the frontier. There's the guys, the unsung heroes, the cowboys, the warriors, soldiers, everything. It's the guy who actually comes in and you know figures out where everything's supposed to go. Those are the guys who make frontier settlement possible. Now, being a surveyor, Washington learns a lot of really useful stuff. Things are going to help him out a lot later on. Uh, for one, surveying involves a lot of math. Like all great generals, Washington's a great math guy, great mathematician. Uh, he's also very good at reading maps. This is a very vital skill. Most of history's great leaders are map guys. Uh, even, even when you look at uh, 
in the ancient world where maps weren't that good, uh, knowing the lay of the land is important. Just having getting an intuitive sense of, okay, how, how, what's the, the crest of that hill? What's the slope on the other side? Well, how's this river wind? Where is this forest likely to end? How fast can someone go over this type of terrain? These are things a general needs to know. And way before Washington's a general, way before he even embarked on a military career, he's learning these things. It's going to help him out a lot later. Uh, Personality-wise, Washington is, a, is a, a difficult man, I guess you would say. Washington is born with a terrible, just volatile temper. Now, he's aware of this. Unlike a lot of just irrational men, people who constantly get into conflict and argument, Washington knows he has a temper. And most of, most of his life, he's struggling. Washington uh, works very hard to tame this temper, uh, this natural sort of uh, energy and anger, I guess you would say, that he has. That's going to help him out later in a, in a military role as well. Uh, you can't let emotions get, oh, get a hold of you when you're in a battle or something like that, where you have to be the solid one. You have to be the disciplined one. And everybody around you, and you're the officer, everybody around you is looking to you for strength, for stability. Washington conquers this side of himself. It's a very important part of his character. Washington on the surface, a very calm, rational, deliberate man, but beneath that is this kind of volcanic energy. And mastering that, again, key to, his, key to understanding his mind. Well, Washington, uh, like a lot of men at the time, like a lot of people now, he gets a powerful patron and that helps him make his way up. Uh, Lord Fairfax, a local English nobleman who comes over and owns a bunch of land in Virginia, uh, he likes the young Washington. Washington, uh, you know, enters kind of because one of his uh, you know, go-to guys, I guess you call him. And uh, Washington is introduced to powerful people in Virginia, including the governor, uh, George Dinwiddie. Now, Dinwiddie sees potential in Washington. Here is this guy. He's very, very tall, uh, very powerfully built. It's one thing that people always said about Washington. He's a very strong guy. And just, you know, just likes how this guy looks, uh, sees a lot of potential in him. And he gives Washington a military commission in the Virginia militia. Washington gets made a major. And right around the time he's made a major, Dinwiddie says, Young Mr. Washington, I have a job for you. See, out on the frontier, no, not quite there. Out on the frontier, where Virginia extends all the way out and Pennsylvania extends all the way out, we're bumping into the French. Now, we haven't talked much about New France in this class right now. But please understand, the French are up there in Canada, and they're down south there in, in New Orleans, along the Mississippi River. And so what you have basically is this kind of arc, moving down from Canada, moving up the Mississippi River, like this crescent. And right in, running right into that crescent is British col uh, colonialism moving west. So these two things are colliding with each other, and they're colliding at the point uh, where the Ohio and the Allegheny and all these rivers in western Pennsylvania and Ohio meet. The French want to settle that area, it's very valuable to them, the local Indian tribes, uh, to get fur. Just like the Dutch, these guys are also trading for furs. The French aren't bringing in massive numbers of people. Again, like the Dutch, they're there mostly to make money. But that's not going to happen if the British are coming in and taking their territory. Now, so why don't they just, you know, everybody stays where they are? Well, no one really knows where New France begins and New England ends. No one really knows the, the boundaries of these things. When everybody's claiming all this land in the 1400s and 1500s and 1600s, no, one's really, no one really knows the extent of anything they're claiming. The Virginia Company's charter, for example, the Virginia Company's charter says uh, they control, Virginia Company controls all the land within this latitude all the way as far until the ocean. So basically, uh, everything from Virginia west to the Pacific Ocean belongs to the Virginia Company. It's just a straight strip of land across the, what's today the United States. Now, they gave that to them because no one really knew how far that was. No one knew how far America extended west. And the French, same thing. They claim all these lands and just nobody really knows where the boundaries are. So it's not really clear who controls what on the frontier. And of course, what happens when nobody's clear about land boundaries? You get conflict. In the middle of this conflict are the various Indian tribes that you see in the Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Canada area, all these different groups, Western New York, they're in the middle of this. Now remember we talked about Indian War before. We talked about how war on the frontier generally is very, very brutal. Uh, we also talked about how Indian War is never just settlers versus Indians or Europeans versus Indians. It's always one group of Europeans and another group of Indians 
versus another group of Europeans and another group of Indians. That's what's going to happen here. The French have got a bunch of allies. The English have got a bunch of allies. And all those people are now getting mobilized. This whole conflict is spiraling to a head. Well, back to Washington now. Then when he says, Washington, we got the French out here in the Ohio River Valley, and they're building forts and they're making friends with the Indians. And what I want you to do is go out there and tell them that they need to go. So Washington's okay, gets a company of soldiers, marches out there. Uh, oh, by the way, Dinwiddie is an investor in the Ohio Company, so he's got a personal financial interest in making sure the French aren't there. Now, so Washington marches out and he meets with a French commander who's out there. He got there, sees they're building a fort. So he goes out there and says, hey, you guys can't build a fort here. The French commander says, basically tells Washington where he can you know, stick his orders. So Washington, not without any further instructions, marches back to Virginia and says, hey, Governor Dinwiddie, uh, they don't want to move. So Governor Dinwiddie says, okay, well, here's what you do then. I'm going to bump you up from Major Lieutenant Colonel and we get some more men. Not a lot. you got to recruit your own on the way. So go march off with that. And then when you get to where they are, build a fort just kind of right down the road from them. And then they can't proceed any further and kind of block their path. Right? And if they try to stop you, you know what to do. Watch it, okay. But marches up, gets some allies on the way, goes up where the French iron builds what he calls Fort Necessity, which, is, as the name implies, is not built in a good spot. Well, the French don't like him there, uh, so that and things start to escalate. And this is where it gets kind of kind of hazy exactly what happens. Washington, apparently, believing the French are just on their way to kick him out. Uh, decides to do a preemptive strike. He gets a few men, he's talking about a few dozen men, uh, with some Indian allies. And they march off to ambush this French party that's coming their way. Now this French party is led by a guy named Captain Jumaville. Jumaville is uh, you know, just one of the French officers uh, out there. And uh, Washington uh, surrounds them, their camp with his Indian allies, and they attack and it's just a complete success. Washington is, is you know, just completely taking these guys off guard. He's captured, shot a few people, captured everybody. It's a military triumph. And here's where things get kind of murky. Whatever happens next is a complete disaster. There's different versions of it. Washington himself gave different versions of it. The French have different versions of it. Uh, Indians have different versions of it. But one of the following things happened. Either uh, Jumaville is killed in the conflict, just gets shot in the head, whatever dies, um, and that's the end of that. That's the, the I guess, the version that reflects best on Washington. There's uh, the idea that uh, Jumaville tried to surrender, and he was shot by an English soldier. The Indians uh, tried to stop the uh, English from attacking the French, and that didn't work. The English just had to kill him. And then there's the version that you see, I'd say most often in history books, where Washington has captured these guys, Jumaville, a few guys are dead, he's captured Jumaville, Jumaville is disarmed, he has accepted his prisoner status and all that. One of Washington's Indian allies, a guy known as the Half King, this is a title you see sometimes for various chiefs, but they call him the Half King. Half King, for whatever reason, does not like the French. It seems like he tried to be a French ally and they d disrespected him or did something like that. And we talked about this kind of endemic warfare, this idea that if you're made to look not tough, then you got to do something about it. Your pride as a warrior, that kind of thing. Well, Half King apparently sees Jumaville and has some kind of personal animosity towards him. And so he walks over with his tomahawk and just tomahawks Jumaville to death right there in front of everybody. And then uh, one account says he... You know, Cut the top of his head off and washed his fingers and his brains and then cut the scalp, the scalp off and that was that. Well, whatever happened, that's the version that that happened, that really reflects badly on Washington. This guy is his prisoner and he's allowed this guy to be killed in his custody. That looks very, very bad. What makes it even worse is Washington goes back to Fort Necessity. The French come with a much bigger force, attack Fort Necessity, and Washington has to surrender. They take Washington prisoner. They force Washington to sign this uh, basically document outlining his version of the events. Washington doesn't read French or speak French or anything, and they kind of gave him the gist of what it said. But apparently, it would actually use the term assassinate, as if Washington was in the area specifically to murder this officer. Well, to make a very complicated story very simple, as simple as I can make it anyway, uh, word gets back to France, word gets back to Britain. The two governments uh, basically are at odds with each other. 
France is demanding that England pull back completely from the area. The British say, go back to Canada and Mississippi. You're not in this area. It's our territory. And the whole thing just spirals into a big war. All because Washington and a couple dozen guys getting into a shootout in you know, western Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio. So this little tiny incident starts this big war. Uh, what's known, in, if you're taking Western Civ II, we'd call it the Seven Years' War. One thing about wars, a lot of times they have different names. Uh, sometimes uh, they're given different names at the same time, sometimes afterwards. Uh, for example, uh, the Civil War. You'll see uh, what, what it's called. Uh, it depends on your kind of political views, political allegiance. Now it's called the Civil War. Uh, at the, um, if you ask people in the South in 1880 what the war was called, that's the War for Southern Independence or the War of Northern Aggression which, had it succeeded, it would have been the Southern Revolutionary War, the Confederate Revolutionary War. Because they lost, it's the American Civil War. Wars have different names. Now, the Seven Years' War is the broader global conflict. It, it's fought in Europe, it's fought in the Caribbean, it's fought in the, in the East, in India, it's fought all over the place. The Seven Years' War, as it takes place in America, is known as the French and Indian War because it involves, I guess they don't need to say British, French, and Indian War, because they're the British, but it involves French, uh, French on one side, British, and then you have Indian allies on both sides. You French people, Indians, and British people involved. This is kind of the idea. Now, what does this mean for America? Well, for the first time, for the first time you're getting a massive British military involvement. The British government now sends an army to North America to help get rid of the French once and for all, uh, to safeguard the borders of the American colonies. You don't see this before then. There aren't, Amer there aren't British armies landing and operating uh, in any kind of scale in North America before this. Actually, you can kind of see this one. <laughs> now, uh, here's maps. You can kind of see what I was talking about here. Uh, this is the French territory, kind of goes around an arc, and here's British territory. So you're moving west, they're this way, you're going to bump into them sooner or later. The Caribbean. We talked about these little islands where they're producing sugar and tobacco. These are very valuable. So much so that, well, we'll talk about after the war what happens, but the, these little tiny islands, they are, they are worth negotiating large amounts of land for. Uh, we're here in India. <laughs> you get the British East India Company fighting the French and all these different... Uh, different conflicts going on over there. What's happening in India is obviously outside the scope of United States history, but will, you know, does play a part in this war. So, the British send soldiers to America. They march out from Pennsylvania. Going toward that French fort I mentioned, the French fort's called Fort Duquesne, which is right here. This British force is under the command of a guy named Braddock. Major Edward, or General Edward Braddock. Now, Braddock's got a few thousand men under his command, and he's an experienced leader. Unfortunately for Braddock, he's very experienced fighting in Europe. In Europe, there are tactics that are very effective, uh, that he's been schooled in, uh, but those tactics don't always translate very well to the Americas. Uh, for one thing, he's fighting in a much, much more uh, forested area, uh, much more wild than he's used to. Uh, the basic tactics of the time involve soldiers fighting in formation, uh, dense formation, where they're uh, let, sending out volleys of musket fire. Uh, a musket being a... No, don't confuse a musket with a rifle. They're not the same thing. Uh, a musket is a smoothbore long arm, which means it's a, a long arm, you fire it from your shoulder with two hands. The inside of the barrel of a musket is, not, is, is smooth. You drop a ball, well, you put gunpowder in, you drop a ball down into it, ram everything tight together, cotton back the hammer, put a little gunpowder on it, cut the hair back all the way, hold it up, fire. When the hammer, which just has a piece of flint in it, hits a steel pan, it makes a spark, that spark hits the gunpowder. Gunpowder ignites the gunpowder inside the barrel, out the barrel, out the ball goes. Now, the problem with this is that the ball, in order to get it down into the barrel, the ball has to be slightly smaller than the diameter of the muzzle. Which means when you fire it, the ball bounces around just a little bit and then it flies out. And when it flies out, it's not going straight, it's going in a slightly different random direction. So these are not extremely accurate weapons. A hundred yards is really the maximum effective range and you're not going to fire it that distance all the time. So these guys are not far away from each other when they're shooting. 
In order to maximize effectiveness, you get lines of guys firing and firing. And because these are single shot weapons that take about 20 to 30 seconds to reload, uh, if you're just out there by yourself, you're going to get ridden down by cavalry and killed. So everybody's in a dense formation. You know, you'll fix bayonets to, so you don't have to worry about cavalry riding you down and just fight like that. In America, these big dense formations aren't as effective. The massive use of cavalry is not a problem. Uh, and not only that, uh, there's just, it's hard to maneuver large groups of guys like that in a more wooded terrain. Braddock uh, gets to America, he sees the situation, and decides that he's just going to do exactly what he'd been doing all along. Uh, which is to say, he is going to march in European style and just fight that way and, you know, too bad. Americans will have to learn to fight his way. Well, Braddock, for whatever reason, takes a liking to Washington. And Washington, as commander of the Virginia militia, marches off with them. And they march off toward Fort Dickens to take it over. Braddock, uh, just like he doesn't really care about American tactics, doesn't really care much about Native Americans. He scorns their help. He doesn't really go out for guides or anything like that. And so he's just marching along, completely unaware that the French are you know, massing right in front of him. The French have adapted very well to New World tactics. They've got the European-style formations, but they've also got skirmishers uh, fanning out into the woods around them. Uh, men with rifles, which is to say a long arm, two fired from the shoulder, two hands like that. But unlike the musket, it has a spiral groove on the inside. Now you take the, the rifle ball, you ram it down in there. It's, it fits very tightly in there. So it takes longer to load. It takes about a minute to load. You ram that ball down there. When you fire it, that ball hugs that groove and it spins. And when it spins coming out, that means it's going much, much straighter. So it's much more accurate. One of these rifles is effective to you know, 500, 600 yards, perhaps, uh, depending on a skilled shot. And as, as soon as I say how effective it is, there's going to be somebody on the internet, oh, I can you know, do it farther and probably. So research it for yourself. 500 to 600 yards, that's what I've heard. Look, I'm sure there's somebody who's broken some kind of better record with just a, you know old um, long rifle, no scope, or anything like that. So look it up for yourselves. Well... French have these, Indians have these, they have skirmishers out and fanning out around the main body of soldiers. Braddock's men just stumble right into them and just get caught in this crossfire. Uh, it is a just disaster. Braddock's men are almost, or they at least believe they're surrounded. They're getting shot from all sides. They're forming up and just firing into the trees in big formations. It's not helping them. They're not hitting anything. As people are watching, uh, people drop around them. All the officers are getting killed, dropping around them. Nobody knows what to do. Uh, people start to flee. Braddock's trying to take control of the situation. He's riding out on his horse. Horse after horse gets shot out from under him. He's still out there just trying to organize everybody. Trying to, you know, Because, of course, the worst thing that can happen to a group of soldiers is panic. Everybody starts to flee and run away. And then Braddock is shot and killed himself. Washington, despite the fact he has no actual command in the main British Army, he's a militia commander, remember, Washington, just by force of personality, takes command of these guys and organizes a re or semi-organized retreat and is able to basically save this force from being completely annihilated. Braddock's expedition is a disaster. The British had hoped if we send out this army and just knock the French out quickly, it won't be a long war. It won't be an expensive war. That's the other thing. Wars are very expensive. That expense of this war is actually going to be a major issue later on. So please understand, the British are dumping a ton of money into this already, and now Braddock's expedition has failed. They've got to dump a ton more. Well, war starts 1754, Braddock's expedition are going into 1755. The British just keep losing over and over again. Uh, from 1755 all the way to 1758, it is a string of French victories. The British are not able to capitalize on the assets they have. The main asset the British have is way more people. The British have something like 20 times, the, the British population is 20 times that of the French population in the New World. But the French have made the key Indian alliances. Uh, the French are have long-standing uh, business, uh, business and social relationships with the Native Americans. And so the, uh, the British are just helpless. They cannot defeat, they cannot break the French. Plus, the British are trying to fight this war on the cheap. They don't want to make a massive commitment of soldiers. They don't want to send more guys in and have that problem. Well, they either, they got to do one of two things. They've either got to retreat, give up, let the French have what they want, or they've got to double down. This is an, anytime you get in any kind of conflict, you got to decide whether to walk away or double down. 
you guys, you know, Kenny Rogers, gambler, you know, he'll tell you about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, walk away or double down. So, British uh, new British government falls, a new government gets elected. Uh, again, William Pitt, and Pitt says, double down. We're going to win this. We're going to spend what we need to spend to win. We're going to send armies over there. We're going to send the Navy to the Caribbean to deal with all these French sugar islands and stuff, but we're going to send an army to North America. Here's the main strategy, though. Not only are we going to try to take Fort Duquesne again, we're going to attack the French where it really hurts. We're going to attack French Canada. Now, if you look here, <coughs> you can see what they're doing. Now, uh, this, uh, <coughs> There's an expedition in 1758, going to 1759. Uh, the oh, sorry, I'm, looking <laughs> I'm way far north. <laughs> an expedition, the Forbes expedition right here, uh, that goes and attacks Fort Duquesne. Uh, they managed finally in 1758 to take Fort Duquesne. Fort Duquesne is then renamed Fort Pitt, which later becomes Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So that's where all this takes place. Uh, but the main strategy here is to take over Canada. So. Naval force under the command of James Wolfe, or, or military force, overall military force under the command of James Wolfe, uh, Vance Canada, 1759. They sail up the St. Lawrence River, St. Lawrence Seaway right here, St. Lawrence River, and they attack Quebec. Uh, Quebec is the, uh, the, one of the most important cities in French Canada. And you can see, again, you'll, when I post all these, you'll be able to see what I'm, exactly what I'm talking about. You can see Quebec is vital because it's right here at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. This is the gate you have to control if you want to control all of this. French traders operate in the Great Lakes area. They operate in this area around here on St. Lawrence River. All this, all these Indians around here, they can get on uh, canoes, boats, send their furs here, 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 and then it goes from place to place to place, and then eventually makes it here to Quebec, Montreal to Quebec, and then out to France. So this is the key. Conquer Quebec, if you have this under your control, nothing can get through and out and you basically have an economic stranglehold on French Canada. So, British attack. The Battle of Quebec in 1760 is a major battle in the history of the New World. The British commander, James Wolfe, and the French commander, Louis-Joseph de Montcalm, uh, both die in this battle, this massive battle. And generals risk their lives. We already saw Braddock got killed. These guys are out there on horses, leading their men right in the front, you go here, you go here, and all that, and people are aiming for them. And Braddock and Montcalm are both killed in this battle. But the end result of it is a British victory. The British take over Quebec. They proceed to move south, as you can see, moving the other direction right here. You get Montreal taken over, British you know, forts on the Great Lakes, and it, uh, French forts in the Great Lakes. All this starts to fall apart for the French. They just do not have the material resources to outlast the British, plus the British much larger population. The death knell is really here for French new, the French New World. Now, there's a few things here that are going to be extremely important as we move on. One, the Treaty of Paris. Now, there's going to be several treaties of Paris. I think I have it on your uh, on your term sheet as Treaty of Paris. There's also uh, Treaty of Paris and then the Revolutionary War. There's lots of Paris is an important place. But just know this is the Treaty of Paris 1763. 1760, the war is effectively over, the British have won, but it peters on for three more years. You'll see this with wars a lot of times. It's kind of, the big battle's over, and they just kind of linger, and then eventually people decide to make peace. Well, the British and French get together, along with everybody else who's gotten involved. The Spanish have gotten involved. Everybody, you know, all these other European powers have just gotten their you know, trying to get their chunk out of it. So, here's what they decide. Here's how we're going to end the war and be friends again. In the first place, British people, you're going to give back all those sugar islands you took in the Caribbean. Give them back to France, including, you know, Haiti and all that. So in return for that, we, the French, will give to the British Empire, French Canada. Now, Spain, you helped France out. So France, in return for that, is going to give you the Mississippi part of New France in the New World, Louisiana. So the British get French Canada, the Spanish get Louisiana. The French get their sugar islands back and consider themselves to have made a pretty good bargain. Uh, you'd, you'd want to trade a few of their sugar islands for all of French Canada. They're worth that much. 
The British also get uh, something, uh, Florida. Interestingly, Florida is a British colony during the American Revolution, but it plays no role whatsoever in it. There are actually 14 colonies. You got Florida down there too. It's weird, but they just it doesn't really come up as an issue in the revolution. I'm not aware of any founding father who says, hey, let's try to get Florida involved. Obviously, the population is small. They're all speaking Spanish. So probably not going to be able to jump on board the American Revolution train right away. But you know, still, it's kind of, kind of odd that nobody seems to have wanted to involve them. I may be wrong about that. Maybe somebody from Florida who knows Florida history really well who can correct me, but I don't think so. Interesting, but not. So what, you, what are the results of this? Well, New France, France in the North America is, is dead. There is no more New France. Just like there's no more New Netherland, there's no more New France. And New France used to look so menacing. New France ran all down the co all down the border of British America. The British colonies were on this little hug in the coast, basically. New France, which had looked so powerful and so dominant, is now gone. And that barrier that it represented to westward expansion is now gone. Sure, Spain's over here in Louisiana, but who cares about them? Spain, Spain's empire is declining. It's nothing if we just want to march over the Appalachian Mountains and settle. Look at all this land out there. Here's the problem with that as far as the British are concerned. Yeah, there's lots of land out here once you get past the Appalachian Mountains. Lots of Indians live there. <coughs> and, uh, well, yeah, you can move out and try to take their land, but those Indians are going to resist. There are a lot of them. This is, do not think this is uh, America circa 1880. Indian tribes have been conquered, pacified, put on reservations. You're dealing with sporadic resistance. What you're dealing with here are very large societies uh, with, that have a military capacity that is nothing to, nothing to take for granted. Can the British, if they mass all the resources of the empire, march in and defeat them? Probably, sure. But unless they're prepared to, to spend a ton of money and send over a lot of soldiers, that's not going to happen. The Indians are way too formidable for anything short of that. So what you end up with is the British basically saying, we want peace with these tribes over here, so America, hold off on the expanding. Now they've already got this in the works. When the situation for the British on the frontier uh, goes from, hey, we've defeated the French and we're now in control, to absolute horror and devastation. And the story of Pontiac's War uh, just goes to illustrate how the British are thinking about the frontier and what happens. Well, I, Now, most of the tribes in the Great Lakes region, they are allied with the French. They have great business relationships with the French. Uh, many French have intermarried with these tribes, especially the business representatives of these fur companies. If you work for a fur company, uh, typically the company sends you out to this Indian village and you move into the village and you're an important guy, so you'll marry the daughter of a chief. And typically because in, in most Indian societies, descent from the mother is what's important, uh, your, the children from these unions end up becoming very prominent themselves. You get this sort of mixed race cast in these various tribes. They're not French, they're not Indians, they're kind of a blend of both. So the French and Indians, they have a long-standing relationship, uh, mutually beneficial on both sides. That's gone. The French are gone. In its place come the British, and the British aren't just there to trade furs. The British are there for land. The British want to move in as far as the Indians are concerned. They like the French. They want the French back. And they're thinking, if we can just get rid of the British or harm the British enough, then the French will come back and things will be like they were. Now, the British could have stepped in here with some good diplomacy and smoothed things over. They don't. Uh, the British commander and the overall commander of the New World, a guy named Jeffrey Amherst, uh, Amherst comes in and says, uh, you know, the French were really nice to you and gave you gifts and all this stuff. We're not doing that. That's bribery. I got to cut expenses anyway. We are not bribing you. You are British subjects and you will do what the Crown says or else. And more than anything, it's this refusal to give gifts that antagonizes the Indians. For Amherst, it's just bribery. But in, in the Indian societies, this is very important. A chief, not only is he brave in war, he's also liberal when he's distributing gifts. Uh, when you go out and conquer the enemy, and this is something goes travels, when you go back to the Iliad, everything, you know, uh, Beowulf, Hrothgar, you know, the ring giver. A chief is someone who sees the material welfare of his followers. You go out, you attack the enemy, you loot their stuff, the chief gets everything into one big pile, essentially, and doles out stuff to individuals. And this is a way of recognizing someone's value. You give this guy a you know, brand new gun you got as loot, and you say, this guy here, 
he killed 20 guys in the battlefield, and I saw him do it. And this gun is recognition of how brave and tough he is. And everybody sees that. And it goes back to the idea of conspicuous courage. When the chief is rewarding you like that in public, that is a big deal. Not to mention the fact that these gifts are about relationships, reciprocity. I give you something, I can then expect loyalty from you in return. The French understood this at the level also. When I give gifts to this chief, that's me establishing a relationship with the chief. I give him stuff, I expect his loyalty. The chiefs in turn give the gifts they're given out to their people, and it's this big chain of loyalty that goes all the way up and down. Harmony worked for everybody. When the British break this pattern, when they stop giving the chiefs gifts, the chiefs cannot then reward their followers, which means the bonds of loyalty start to break down. You get these independent uh, bands of warriors who go off and do their own thing, which spells trouble for the British. And in 1763, you get this big uprising that develops in the Great Lakes region known as Pontiac's War. Now, traditionally, the credit or blame, I guess, depending on how you approach it, uh, is given to a, an Ottawa chief named Pontiac. But he's probably not the mastermind of all these attacks. He's just the most prominent one calling for them. Pontiac's a militant. He used to be allied with the French. He actually had an honorary brigadier generalship in the French army. And all that's gone now. His status has been reduced. He doesn't have these gifts. So Pontiac basically says, you know what? I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. I'm going to go off and fight. If you want to come with me, do it. And you should. We've got to get rid of the British. So all along the frontier, the Great Lakes region, Pennsylvania, all these places, uh, there are these massive uprisings. Bands of warriors just go out on the attack. And what do they do? Well, they attack frontier settlements. <clears throat> you know, showing up in these isolated towns and, and some isolated farms, essentially, and just they attack and murder everyone. Uh, this is very, very nasty. Everything we're going to talk about here in Pontiac's War is frontier warfare at its absolute worst. Uh, the Indians attack, uh, they surround forts. They use any means they possibly can, including deceptions and things that would be completely illegitimate in European-style warfare. In other words, they show up wanting to talk, and as soon as you let them in, they attack everybody. Uh, at one point, they're playing a game, the, the ball game, where we talked about lacrosse. They're playing a ball game, and they accidentally hit the ball inside the fort, and everybody thinks these guys, Indians are friendly, and they just run in to get the ball, and all of a sudden, oh, they start killing everybody. They have secret weapons hidden on them. Uh, they murder women, they murder children, they murder infants. Now, do not get the idea, by any means, that this is just the Indians on one side doing this. The British strategy overall, in the long term, is to get rid of the Indians. They don't want Americans coming over right now, uh, because it's gonna, they don't have the forces in place. But long term, their strategic thinking is the Indians have got to go at some point. And to that end, since they're already kind of thinking they've got to go, uh, all kinds of tactics and things that uh, you wouldn't use in Europe are considered valid here. Uh, case in point of how nasty this is really going, uh, you get things like the Enoch Brown Schoolhouse Massacre in 1764. Uh, Enoch, Brown, <coughs> uh, Enoch Brown was a school teacher in western Pennsylvania, had a group of kids in his class, and he's just out there in this little one-room schoolhouse you see in rural areas. Well, a group of four Delaware Indians show up at the school, they kick in the door. Uh, Enoch Brown says, you know, whatever, you'll kill me, but leave the kids alone. They tomahawk him to death and scalp him, and then they kill all the kids and tomahawk and scalp them to death, too. Uh, on the way back to their village, they come across a, a pregnant woman who's walking back to her farm and kill her and do, you know, things really want to describe to her. And uh, now they get back to their village, and the chief, they're, they're, they show off these scalps of all these kids and everything, and the chief just uh, assault, you know, verbally abuses them for being the wor most worthless kinds of cowards there are. Uh, this is not something that was admired in these Indian societies at all, but that's what's going on here, this mindset. And of course, in response to the Enoch Brown Schoolhouse Massacre, uh, the Pennsylvania legislature, remember John Penn, the Penn family runs Pennsylvania, he's the governor, the Pennsylvania legislature, they pass a law saying there's now a bounty for scalps. Which is to say, if you go out and kill an Indian man, uh, that's worth $134. Uh, and, and woman, 50 bucks. Please understand, uh, $200 could buy you a decent sized farm, some modern money, but $200 could buy you a decent sized farm at the time. Uh, so that, there was a major cash incentive to kill Indians. And of course, when you bring the scalp in to the collect your bounty, no one really knows who this guy is. He could have been peaceful just sitting there farming. You ran it behind him, killed him, and scalped him. Things that, and scalping is something Europeans especially believe is barbaric. It's something the Indians do. They don't, the Pennsylvania legislature is paying 134 bucks a scalp. Uh, forts get besieged. The Indians will come, surround a fort, besiege it. Uh, fort Pitt gets besieged. We talked about them. You know, used to be Dickens. 
Fort Pitt gets besieged. They kill all the farmers around them, scalp them, ritual cannibalism, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. And the English inside the fort uh, get the idea to uh, do an exchange with them when they come out to you know talk peace or whatever. They, they bring gifts as custom we established. We talked about. Uh, they bring out these gifts and they bring them blankets from the smallpox infirmary. In other words, people who are suffering from smallpox, they're in a special wing of the hospital. They you know put blankets on them like you would any patient. The British take those blankets and they hand them to the Indians. No one knows about germs or viruses or anything yet. That's in the future. But they do know if you're close to people with smallpox or their stuff, you tend to get smallpox. They are deliberately, and this isn't conjecture, oh, they gave them those blankets, maybe they meant something else. They deliberately meant to give these people smallpox. Uh, they were trying to wipe them out. This is the only example you see in American history uh, where biological warfare is actually used uh, by an army as an act of war. And it's biological warfare in the strictest sense. This is as nasty as it gets. Pontiac's War is the worst, most savage frontier war there, ever, there is in American history by far. Nothing after this will equal it. And the worst thing about it, as far as the British are concerned, uh, is that there is no victory. It doesn't end, it just kind of peters out. Uh, Pontiac himself eventually shows up, they sign a, a sort of a treaty. All these different Indian groups, they all one after another sign treaties or truces or something and promise not to fight anymore. But there's no victory. The British don't defeat anybody. There's no ba you know, Battle of Horseshoe Bend. There's no, <coughs> you know, nothing like that. It's just, it just stops, dissolves. What the British were faced with was a coalition of Indian tribes. Not necessarily the whole tribe, but enough warriors from all these different tribes to be a total frontier pan-Indian threat. That remains the big nightmare. That's something everybody wants to avoid. You can fight this tribe or that tribe, but if all the tribes unite, or at least enough of them unite, that's a major problem. I mean, understand, if, if, these, if the Indians had been more organized, they could have marched right on to Philadelphia. You know, Amherst, while he's making these threats, has stationed exactly 500 regular British soldiers on the frontier. There are tens of thousands of Indians. He's got 500 guys there and thinks they'll be pacified with that. So when this violence and bloodshed and horror finally all just dies down, the British say, all right, here's what we're going to do. We don't want to antagonize the Indians anymore. Sure, you know, we don't, we don't want them around, but we, have, we do not have the resources to displace them right now. We want peace on the frontier. As such, we don't want any settlers moving independently into Indian territory where they're going to build farms and stuff, and the Indians are going to attack them, and then the militia is going to call, get called out to attack the Indians. It's going to spread into a war. We don't want any conflict. So... The Proclamation Line, the Proclamation Act of 1763 establishes the Proclamation Line. And what the Proclamation Line basically says is, no one is allowed, no British settler, is allowed to settle beyond the Appalachian Mountains. That is the border. That is as far as British North America is ever going to go. Everything past that, that's Indians. Or whoever, that's, that's not us. So, here's the people of America looking at this. And this is seen... Uh, very widely as a betrayal. Here we go. We're, we're Americans. We joined our militia. We fought the Indians. We fought Pontiac. We got rid of the French. That was the barrier. That's what was keeping us from expanding. This looming Catholic uh, absolute monarchy, this, this threat on, on our border, it's gone now. Now America can expand, and now the British government, our government, is telling us no. No moving west, that's it. This arouses a lot of anger. And not only does it arouse anger, it arouses anger everywhere because this affects every colony. Everywhere along this frontier, people want to expand west, and they're not allowed to do it anywhere. And in fact, the British are willing to force you out at bayonet point if you try to do it. Oh, well, that's everything about Pontiac's War. Now, before we get into uh, before we get into talking about the First Great Awakening, I want to talk to you guys about the Enlightenment. Uh, the Enlightenment is something we're going to be hitting on as we move into the American Revolution, but I want to introduce it now. 
because it's very important to understand in terms of the intellectual life of America. Now, when you talk about uh, going into the, the 1500s, 1600s, you're talking about the Renaissance. The Renaissance, you see all these, this revival of classical learning, and people take that and they build on it. And there are advances in every area of life, whether you're talking about architecture, art, the sciences, mathematics, everything. There are these advances. And this leads into something you, you see called the scientific revolution, where people are now looking at physical phenomena systematically. You get Francis Bacon, the idea of inductive reasoning, uh, scientific method, that sort of thing. And this new learning, uh, the new math, the new science, new way of approaching the world, uh, as it evolves into the movement of the 1700s, uh, you get this idea of the Enlightenment. Now, roots of the Enlightenment. Well, for example, you got this guy Descartes, René Descartes. Uh, René Descartes is a French philosopher, and he's actually a soldier during the Thirty Years' War, which we didn't talk about, it's way back. Uh, but Descartes is really the founder of modern philosophy. Uh, he's founder of modern philosophy because he looks at everything, every philosophy that came before him from a position of doubt, of skepticism. He says, I don't know about Aristotle, Plato, anything like that. I can't be sure what they're saying is true. So I'm going to just assume it's not true. What do I know absolutely is necessarily true? What he comes up with very famously is, cogito uh, ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. I know, I, it, you cannot prove to me that I'm not thinking. If I, if I close my eyes, and, you know, am I thinking, am I thinking? The very fact that I'm thinking about thinking proves I'm thinking. That's philosophy. <laughs> um, and from there he proceeds to build this rationalist edifice, this idea of you know, exploring the universe with your mind, but with no reference to prior philosophical traditions. Uh, you get people like John Locke. He's going to be very important uh, as we move into the Founding Fathers. John Locke, uh, among other things, a political thinker. The Enlightenment, more than anything, is about a rejection of tradition, or at the very least, a, reinterpret a reinterpretation of tradition along rationalist lines, using human reason to understand the world. If you've got to define the Enlightenment in just a really simple sentence or a couple sentences, it's the Enlightenment is about using human reason to understand the world and to make progress, uh, moral progress, social progress, uh, to move ahead towards some goal, towards some better way of living. In the Enlightenment, there's this idea, not, not everybody holds it to the same degree, some people, some people even don't hold it, or don't hold it, but this idea that human beings are perfectible, uh, that human beings can be improved, that uh, society can be changed such that humans are able to realize their full potential, that sort of thing. Well, John Locke, among other things, is a uh, political thinker. John Locke develops this idea of a social contract. Uh, you have the people who are ruled, the people who rule. Everybody has rights, and they enter into a union uh, and establish a government to secure those rights. When the government is not securing those rights, it is the, th those rights essentially revert back to the people, and they're allowed to dissolve that government, or at least their association with it, and then create a new government. Locke moves straight in Declaration of Independence. We're going to talk about Locke later on and John, uh, sorry, Thomas Jefferson's great debt to him. And you get other guys, Voltaire, Diderot, Montesquieu, Rousseau. We have more time, we'll talk about those guys. We'll hit on them here and there. But I just want you guys to know that. Enlightenment, reason, science, political reform, three things. Using the human mind, using human reason uh, to understand the world, to solve problems, to make progress. This uh, notion of the perfectibility of mankind. That's the Enlightenment. Major Enlightenment thinkers. We're going to see people. Benjamin Franklin, huge major Enlightenment figure. Uh, not just a man who read all this stuff, but a man who was a major thinker himself. Thomas Jefferson. We're gonna, you know, these are Americans are very much involved in this Enlightenment. But please understand this about the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is a high up level thing. The Enlightenment is really something for the elites. Most Americans aren't enlightened in that sense. Uh, American life is still informed very, very much by tradition. And one of the profoundest traditional attachments American ha Americans have is to their religion. We talked about this on day one. Americans tend to be a very religious people, more so than any other people in the industrialized world. Uh, America, uh, many people came to America specifically for religious reasons. We talked about those Calvinists, Puritans, and Pilgrims. And America is a place of great religious diversity, but also but still great religious devotion. There are many different traditions, but people tend to hold them pretty tightly. To that end, America is the scene of frequent religious revivals. Uh, here are two very famous revivalists. 
Uh, the first of these gentlemen here is Jonathan Edwards. Do not, uh, if you Wikipedia him, do not confuse him with the psychic guy, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, two very different people. Uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, is a Puritan preacher out of Massachusetts. Now, he's not a full-time preacher anywhere. He's kind of a, uh, what do you call him? I guess like a fill-in preacher. Uh, preaches here, preaches there. You know, kind of like a temporary assignment, six months, eight months. The regular preacher isn't there. They haven't hired one yet or something. That's kind of his job. Uh, works as a tutor at Yale, a, a Calvinist, but also, uh, in addition to being a theologian, someone who's very you know, learned in Greek and Latin and scripture and everything like that, uh, he's also a major scientific thinker. Uh, Jonathan Edwards participates in this Enlightenment. He is an Enlightenment guy. The difference between him and a lot of these other Enlightenment guys is a lot of the other Enlightenment guys go to deism. Uh, deism is the, the idea that there is a God, uh, but he does not interfere in the world. God has created the universe and he wound it up like a watch and just lets it go. He created everything. He's a creator God, but he is not an imminent God. He is not a God who's involved in his creation. Edward says, no, no. When I look at nature, when I look at everything that God made, I can see his presence in it. And more importantly, I can feel his presence in it. And it is that emotional religious content that's going to define the first great awakening. Early 1730s, John, Jonathan Edwards, he's out there just you know, being a regular Puritan guy, preaching all that stuff. And he looks around and he's troubled by some of the things he sees. For one thing, uh, the kids in town, they're just not taking their religion seriously. It's like everybody's going through the motions. The preacher gets up there and just talks. The people just get to sit there and just listen. The kids twiddle their thumbs. If they had had iPhones, they'd be playing with them, but they don't, so they just, you know, sit there, whatever. And then the kids are out there with night walking, just to say, hanging out with you know, boys and girls are hanging out at night, just wandering around. As any Puritan preacher knows, it's one step from that to devil worship. And what he's concerned about is, you know, people don't, you know, they're not involved because they don't feel it. So Jonathan Edwards develops this preaching style. Uh, that's very emotional. Now, it's not to say that he's up there just ranting and raving and all that stuff. Uh, he actually had kind of a deadpan delivery. But the way he preached aroused strong emotions in people. Uh, if you ever get a chance, read the sermon, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Actually, maybe I'll put a link to that. I'll see what I can do in the description box. Um, put a link to that. Um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You know, God's holding, God is holding you like a spider or a loathsome insect over a fire. And all he has to do is open his fingers and drop you. And it's just his mercy that keeps you from burning in hell. And you need to remember that. And you need to reflect upon your sinful nature. And you need to realize what God wants you to do. And people were just taken aback by this. Um, he goes from you know, town to town preaching. People invite him to come in and preach. Um, there's actually a wave of suicides. People listen to him preach and they determine that they are not one of the elect and saved and in despair kill themselves. This does happen. Uh, Jonathan Edwards actually is, is quite upset. He doesn't know why people are doing this. Uh, as, as far as he's concerned, his message is very positive. But anyway, uh, so Jonathan Edwards, and this is something you see, that he's the first celebrity preacher. This is going to be something you see in American history over and over again. Uh, because he's not, he, you know, if you're in a regular pastor in a church every Sunday, you preach a different sermon. But if you go from town to town, you can preach the same sermon and get really good at delivering it. You know where to pause, where to go ahead, when to crack a joke, that kind of thing. And he doesn't crack jokes, but you get the idea. So these guys become really famous. Their sermons are reprinted. The thing of it is, though, guys like Jonathan Edwards, because they're celebrities, they have a, unintentional, at least for Edwards, uh, effect of displacing the authority of the local guys. A lot of people, a lot of the established ministers, do not like Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is a new light. He's a person who embraces this religious revival and the emotionalism that comes with it. The old lights, the really strict traditionalists, the people who want to stick to things the way they are, uh, they don't like this. They realize, which is really true, uh, that emotion and religion uh, these things can be very, very dangerous. One thing you'll see throughout history, religion is like a wild animal. Uh, you open the cage, it runs out, you don't know what it's going to do, and it's not going back in that cage until it's exhausted. It might sit there and just sniff daffodils, it might tear people apart. But it, you can't control it. The best you can do is kind of maybe urge to go one way or another. But there's no controlling it. You unleash these emotions, all kinds of passions arise. Even more successful than Jonathan Edwards in terms of celebrity is this guy, George Whitfield. Uh, George Whitfield, uh, he's the subject of your reading, Ben Franklin, uh, very insightful about him, it's an interesting reading. 
So I won't get too into Whitfield. I want you guys to talk about it. If I get a chance to talk about it with you, I want to talk about it. Uh, Whitfield is the son of an innkeeper. He actually works as a bartender for a while. Uh, goes to college, kind of on a scholarship type thing. Uh, while he's in college, meets the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, who are the founders of Methodism. Uh, he believes very strongly what they're doing, although he maintains a Calvinist theology as opposed to their Anglican theology. But anyway, uh, he becomes a Methodist minister. And he's a very successful speaker uh, with a powerful voice. Uh, despite being kind of a little pudgy and cross-eyed, women loved him. He was apparently considered an extremely attractive man with a booming voice. And he would just be out there and uh, it, Ben Franklin himself, not in the passage I gave you, Ben Franklin said that he did the calculations and there was something like 30,000 people listening to George Whitfield uh, in the clearing outside Pennsylvania. There was these big outdoor sermons. You guys remember, you know, established preachers kind of leery of these guys. So he's just outdoors. So he's got 30,000 people listening. Bo no microphone, just booming voice. And uh, very successful. Another one of these celebrity preachers. Now, what makes this religious revival important for America's identity? Well, these religious revivals are pan-colony events. Whitfield starts all the way up in New England, and he makes his way all the way down to Georgia and back. He's one of the few people, a tiny number of people, who have actually made that journey. Most people spend their lives in their little colony, or they'll go to one place or another. He's been to all of them. And this idea of a religious revival of celebrities, everybody's reading these guys. The Ben Franklin prints his pamphlets, everybody's printing them. Uh, this is a common culture. But in a, as a, on a deeper level, the Great Awakening is about a rejection of traditional authority. Not a traditional attachment to religion but traditional authorities. People do not necessarily defer to the local minister anymore. Sunday morning, you can go listen to that guy or you can listen to George Whitfield. You have a choice. That person in your regular church has no automatic command on your loyalty. These guys as religious figures are profoundly disruptive to traditional social patterns. Exactly how disruptive all this is uh, between Anger about the proclamation line, the sense of identity you see developing as a result of that, uh, this you know, sense of common culture and religious revival, rejection of traditional authority you see during the First Great Awakening. All of this is going to lead into establishing an American identity. Now, if you have any, well, if there are any questions, don't ask me. You'll be able to ask me soon. Uh, one thing we are working on is being able to communicate directly. We should be able to get some kind of audio contact up. Uh, hopefully Tuesday we'll have something in the works to where we can actually be doing it regularly. Uh, like I said again, I hope to be able to come down there to see you guys as often as possible. I'm working on that as well. I had a, a really great time uh, seeing you all the other day, and I look forward to doing it again. Uh, so, uh, well, if you have any questions, post them in the, I think we talked about the comment section, or just email me, and uh, I'll be able to get back with you. Uh, so I've, uh, I've enjoyed talking to you about the French and Indian War and the First Great Awakening. I hope you've uh, enjoyed watching. Uh, this is Mr. Muma saying uh, goodbye, Oceanside Collegiate Academy, uh, to Ms. McCall and Ms. Han. How are you doing, ladies? And uh, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.